Everybody hear me in the back? Good. I'm Ben Leshin. I'm one of the PGY4s. This talk is finger, hand, and wrist injuries in those other sports. And I'll sort of explain the topic more at the beginning. A little disclosure, I emailed the Chiefs to tell them I was doing this topic. And in response, I got, Ilya is doing his own CrossFit, so don't talk about CrossFit. <laughs> to which I responded, we know Ilya is going to talk about CrossFit. <laughs> I would never give a lecture about CrossFit, and I'm somewhat offended. <laughs> I have never done CrossFit unless you count drinking beer at Hawthorne's while CrossFitters run by laughing at them. <laughs> a little further on that. Um, so the goals of this talk, we're going to do a little outline. There's going to be a lot of talk about anatomy that once upon a time you knew. Um, a little bit of my personal interest in this. We're talking about finger injuries and rock climbers. Uh, biking wrist pain, golfing wrist pain, and rowing wrist pain. Um, why this is pertinent to you, as random as this topic seems, you will see patients with these problems in the clinic or if you go into sports and sideline events. And this helps to broaden the differential. A lot of what we learn, we talk about trigger fingers, carpal tunnel, ulnar tray comes it down. Ulnar entrapment, scaphoid fractures, dequer veins. Anybody who walks in late is getting called out. So hoping to broaden the differential. We spend a lot of time talking about larger joints and have bigger differentials. Um, these are SAE and board tested questions. Two of them I found from missing questions. Um, and a lot about ultrasound. Uh, for the candidates, we often have morning ultrasound time before grand rounds, so you get a lot of exposure for that, and some other uses that people might not be aware of. Ultrasound, ultrasound. Um, so the goals, we're gonna review some wrist, hand, and finger anatomy, and review some biomechanics, and look at some stressors in these sort of fringe sports. A lot of our athletes that you see, the weekend warriors aren't playing full contact football, or dunking basketballs, these people are having other sports that cause other injuries that may be more outside the main, me uh, main media. Also, I'm going to acknowledge as many threes and fours as I can, and by that I mean I'm just going to give everybody a hard time. Um, my personal interest, starting middle school, I am short, <laughs> slow, and when I had hair, it was funny hair, so <laughs> when you're picking teams at recess, I was never picked first for soccer or basketball. So I opted for wrestling, shot put, pole vault, true story. Phil, come in, sit down. You're late. Uh, rugby, some biking, and climbing. So I play a lot of these other sports that maybe not wrestling and shot put anymore, but some other sports that cause injuries to fingers and hands. And I found when I got to PIM in our residency, it was slap injury, slap injury, slap injury, which made me think about this, which some of you may remember, which brings me to the hand. A um, little review of anatomy. There's a lot of bones in the hand. We're going to talk specifically about uh, the lunate and some finger bones and the hamate. And tendons, this is a lot of ligaments that we're not going to go over because there's not time for that. But just to look at all the different places that problems can occur. Um, so the first case is a rock climber coming to the clinic with pain in his middle finger. He says, I was crimping hard on my right hand when my feet cut. There was a pop and immediate pain and swelling. The finger felt very weak afterwards which may be cryptic to a lot of people, but on exam, let's just say the right third digit is tender, greatest at the PIP, edematous, and slightly weaker than the left fourth digit. There's no bowstringing. So we're going to talk about A2 and A4 pulley injuries, a little background on climbing grips. This is a crimp, and it causes you have the flexion of the PIP and extension of the DIP, and this causes a lot of stress to the pulley system. So when talking about these pulleys, we talk, we learn about the FDS and FDP and how those weave, but those are held against the phalanx by a series of pulleys. Uh, there are the annular and cruciform pulleys. The cruciform pulleys are much weaker 
and play less of a role. The annular pulleys are labeled A1 to A5 and run from proximal to distal. The most commonly injured is A2. So in competitive climbers, these injuries occur in 19 to 26%. All climbers, 20%. The ring finger is the most common, and A2 is more common than A4. Um, and this is a sport that's growing. It was even in the New York Times within the past couple of months about a surgence of rock climbing gyms. And as people become more involved in the sport, there's going to be a lot more injuries. And this is the primary one. Clinical presentation, there's often an acute onset of pain, swelling. In severe cases, there may be a pop, an acute hematoma formation, and bowstringing against resistance. And bowstringing looks like this. You can see this is the tendon that should not look like this. And the depiction of this is where you get the A2 rupture here that no longer is that tendon held against the phalanx. So if you're thinking biomechanics, in order to get the lever, it has to stay against the phalanx more closely. Um, diagnosis, sounds repetitive, clinical history and exam. But in this case, the precise diagnosis is very difficult on purely physical exam. Because we can go back and look at all the things going on in the finger. X-ray is a first step to rule out a fracture, low radiation, cheap cost. Ultrasound, the pros are lower cost. You can have dynamic imaging, having somebody move their finger. Um, the cons are operator dependent, and it's difficult to stage. Uh, MRI, not operator dependent. You've got good tissue visualization, but it's expensive and you don't have the option for the dynamic evaluation. Ultrasound, um, there's actually a study that Clauser et al. did, and he did say this was extreme rock climbers, uh, depicted with dynamic ultrasound. So they looked at 34 climbers versus 20 controls, and what they were looking at is the space between the tendon and the phalanx. So like I had mentioned, these pulleys keep those tendons taut and allow them to make that turn so that you have that force generation. If the space was greater than three centimeters at rest or greater than 0.5 centimeters, patients were diagnosed with a pulley rupture. And then they had an MRI subsequently. And I was actually very impressed by this number. Ultrasound was 98% sensitive and 100% specific. So this is one where in the right hands, the ultrasound is a very effective imaging modality. It's in office, it's cheap, and accurate. And this is sort of a just graphic depiction of what they were finding. Um, there was only one case that the MRI found a pulley injury that the ultrasound did not pick up. And there wasn't a time that uh, they said no pulley injury. Sorry. There was one that the MRI picked up. So there's a grading scale for this. There's a shuffle, I think is his name, is a Swede or Swiss. Uh, he seems to have done a lot of the research, and he talks about this grading scale. Grade one is no dehiscence of the tendon from bone, or less than two millimeters on MRI or ultrasound. Grade two is a complete rupture of the A4, or partial rupture of the A2 or the A3. And we looked at the bowstring, because the A2 is more proximal, it is more important in holding that tendon down. Grade three is complete rupture of the A2 or A3 pulleys. And grade four is a complex multipolar rupture or single rupture with associated lumbrical muscle or collateral ligament injury. So treatment, conservative. We're gonna talk about H taping uh, and in the grades one and two. Grade three, moving up, you might need a thermoplastic splint or soft ring cast for 10 to 14 days. I didn't list it, but also um, not climbing, which for people who engage in the sport is something that's difficult to convince them of. Uh, surgical repair for grades four, there's a lot of techniques. Loop and a half, grafting from the extensor retinaculum. I'm not going to get into detail with those. Um, H taping. So this is the one other climber in our program. So H-taping is 
a taping method where you cut the tape, leave the center part attached to that for more protection at the joint and wrap it around. And this is something that sounds simple, but is cost effective. And uh, there's a study out showing that it's more effective. Uh, Shoal tape fingers with H taping versus the more traditional, just circumferential, just wrap the finger or buddy tape. Um, 20 subjects with pulley injuries were selected and tendon bone distance was measured using ultrasound. Uh, Eight of them taped traditionally, just wrapping the finger with tape around. Twelve used this H taping. They were subject to a force platform, so forcing the finger in a measured way over the course of a year. And the subjects who had the H taping had a 16% decrease in the tendon bone distance, whereas those who had traditional taping did not have decrease in the tendon bone distance. So this is we the thing about the therapists being the ones to wrap and tape, but for us to have a knowledge to make more specific recommendations. Second case is a bicyclist with wrist pain. 28, how old are you Dr. Mullen? Are you 28? Yeah. Presents to the office with reduced grip strength and pain over the ulnar side of his wrist. Gives a history of being an avid amateur cyclist with multiple falls. <laughs> True story. <laughs> X-ray shows sclerosis and fragmentation of the lunate. What disease does this patient likely have? So this is called Kindbox disease. Um, that's the lunate. So this is an osteoporosis of the lunate, otherwise known as lunatomalacia. Kindbox is easier. It's an aseptic, I should say idiopathic osteonecrosis of the lunate. Etiology is somewhat unclear. There's a couple theories as to why this happens. A lot of the carpal bones um, are subject to avascular necrosis. The lunate is one here. Um, so there's anatomic variants, vascular abnormalities that predispose it to developing avascular necrosis. The course of the disease, yeah, the initial sclerosis which can lead to necrosis, <laughs> and then thereafter, trabecular fracture, sclerosis, fragmentation, and collapse. And if we look back at the anatomy, based on where this bone is, that other surrounding carpal bones can collapse, and that can lead to a lot of issues in the hand. So catching it early, which we'll talk about later, is important. This is most commonly seen in, in young adults between 20 and 45 year olds, like a 28 year old medical resident. Also seen in a bimodal distribution in children in older age groups. So while the 20 to 45 year olds is most common, there is a set of older adults and younger children that this is seen in, um, sometimes associated in the younger crowd with JRA. There's often a history of trauma, minor repetitive. So this is why bikers, with the constant pressure there, we think of uh, ulnar nerve issues, but it's also that pressure. I saw another article that workers who use um, power tools are also, also uh, at risk for this. Also, Dr. Weimer could hit you with a mace a bunch of times. But there's no data on that one. <laughs> Clinically, this presents with dorsal wrist pain, weakness, and restricted motion. On physical exam, there'll be tenderness over the dorsal lunate. In more advanced cases, there could be swelling. This may do, be due to a synovitis that develops secondarily. Um, if you get a synovitis, you may also have an obliterated anatomic snuff box, restricted anterior posterior drawer test of the wrist. I tried to find a good video of this. We always talk about jaw test and the knee, but it's similar holding the proximal arm, holding the forearm proximally and wiggling the wrist in the AP direction. Increased motion there. Uh, loss of grip, grip strength, loss of wrist motion. And you can even see this without symptoms. It can be found incidentally. And it's one that, if found incidentally, needs to be followed up on. Uh, diagnosis. X-ray is sort of the standard, but it may be normal in early stages, but in later stages may show that sclerosis and collapse of the lunate. MRI is helpful, but less clearly defined. Advantage of MRI 
you do get some idea about any AVN that may be present. And CT is the best modality for showing an occult fracture. The classification system, staging is the Lichtman classification. Stage one, you get normal radiograph, but uh, may show possible lunate fracture. And I highlighted stage two, because very on, early on, you're starting to get the sclerosis. You know, this isn't a later stage where you get the sclerosis, it's in stage two. Um, your lunate begins to deteriorate. 3A, you get the collapse without the scaphoid rotation. B, you get the lunate collapse, scaphoid rotation, surrounding bones may shift. So if you imagine if all your hand bones are collapsing, that's going to greatly deteriorate your grip strength, usage of your hand. They say it's important. And at stage four, degenerative changes around it. In our arthritic wrists, so if you can imagine somebody who's working using their hands at age 28, and the wrist becomes arthritic, that's going to become a major issue in their career. So stage two, you get the sclerosis, and uh, you can sort of see here on the two where you're already seeing changes on x-ray, three even more, and four, you start to see the, sorry, 3B, you start to see the surrounding bones, and by stage four, you have arthritic wrist. So once again, stage two, sclerosis begins. I'm not sure what Dr. Minerard's doing there. Uh, treatment, conservative if early, NSAIDs, splinting, casts. Um, conservative may fail in advanced cases, uh, in which case there's a lot of different uh, articles talking about what type of surgery to perform, which isn't really up to us, but they do joint leveling, radial shortening, ulnar lengthening, intracarpal arthrodesis, proximal row carpectomy, vascularized bone grafts. I think I have picture of that later. But these aren't small surgeries. If they're taking off part of your radius, extending your ulnar bone, these are big procedures to save your hand. So once again, if this comes up early on x-ray, something that should be addressed. Uh, a treatment outcome study was done by Martin and Squire, and they looked at large, excuse me, long-term outcomes for Kimebox disease. Uh, this was a retrospective analysis of 66 patients. The primary outcome measure was the DASH scoring system. I think I have this. So this is used to evaluate patients with disorders of the upper extremity. Um, and you can monitor a patient over time and evaluate efficacy of treatment. I actually saw this in some ortho articles. I didn't know where the big surgeons did this sort of thing, but this is very much ADL testing. Can you open a jar, um, prepare a meal, write? So these are very functional measures. So they looked at these functional measures 44 patients were treated conser conservatively and 18 treated surgically. And they did a DASH score at three separate points within two to three years, between five and 10 years, and after 10 years, and found that there wasn't a difference in the change in DASH score between those treated conservatively versus surgically. Now, the shortcoming of the study is that Patients with more severe disease are likely to be older and more likely to have surgery. So they may not do as well anyways versus those treated conservatively, maybe younger, and therefore more predisposed to have better outcomes. But nonetheless, conservatives should always be tried first. Um, and this is a depiction of the revascularized bone grafting, where they're taking a digital blood supply and taking that down to the uh, looning. Next case is a 35-year-old left, 35? <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> That's definitely not true. 35-year-old left-handed golfer presents with pain on the bowler aspect of his hand. Um, so this is a hook of the handmate fracture. This is another one that I missed the question on a practice question, so this is out there. But reviewing the anatomy, it's articulation, but you have part of the bone that's this hook that comes out. Um, the embryology of that, and this will probably be the only time I ever talk about embryology, um, the body and palmar hook of the handmate develop independently, and these don't fuse to around 15 years of age. So you're not gonna see this issue in children uh, it's rare, 
accounts for 2% of all carpal fractures. That's increasing with the growth of racket and club sports and golf and golf and golf. It's just sort of a depiction of this, just holding the golf club. Um, clinically, this presents with pain in the palm exacerbated by grasp, pain with deep palpation over the hook, pain with dorso ulnar deviation, pain with flexion of the fourth and fifth digits. So there you can imagine the tendons running around that hook. Diminished grip strength, dorsal wrist pain, ulnar nerve paresthesias, mild carpal tunnel syndrome. And secondarily, you can have FDP or FDS, tenosynovitis or tendon rupture. So that's the issue with this fracture is that not just the tendons, but the neurovascular structures are in that area. And if you've got a fracture, that can put those at risk. Uh, pathophysiology, there's three mechanisms by which this can occur. Direct force, a fall, a shearing force from those tendons. Um, maybe if you've got grip strength and a already weak hamate, um, or repeated micro trauma during sports using a club, racket, or bat. And a third of these are cited to be caused by golf. Diagnosis, once again, the clinical presentation should be a first clue. X-ray, this may be difficult to capture the stress fracture. So this is one, another thing we don't talk about as much, specific views of hand X-rays. And there's certain views can improve uh, identification. One is the carpal tunnel view with wrist and full dorsiflexion. The wordy one, partially supinated lateral view with wrist in radial deviation and oblique projections. Um, so these are things to put in orders. In the drop downs, you always see all these other views and we always look at AP lateral flexion, extension views. These are other views to be aware of if you're looking for uh, certain injuries. Bone scan, less talked about, but can pick it up. Ultrasound, we'll talk about. CT scan of the wrists in the praying position is the modality of choice. Sensitivity is 100%, specificity 98.4. Uh, MRI, again, expensive, time consuming, but you can also demonstrate any AVN that's there. So, one ultrasound study, this was. Uh, actually a case report by Sally et al. And this was a 54 year old female who had a fall four months prior. So this is the, is a direct trauma can be a mechanism of injury. Um, presented to, initially to a hand surgeon. He didn't see anything on x-ray, had some pain in the ulnar wrist that radiated down to the fourth and fifth digits. So we are already are thinking ulnar nerve, um, standard x-rays, didn't show anything, but an ultrasound was performed using a linear transducer. There was local tenderness over the hook of the hamate. So in doing the ultrasound exam, you have another specific place to test for tenderness. And it showed discontinuity of the hyperechoic line corresponding to the medial bone cortex of the hamate at the level of the base of the hook. This was consistent with the fracture of the hook of the hamate. And looking at this, this is uh, some images from their study. So you see the small transducer they used. These are normal ultrasounds in the middle, in the lateral and palmar view. And this is from the CT. Um, this is the normal ultrasound. So you're looking at where the hook of the hammock connects to the bone. And that versus here, you can see the fracture in ultrasound. So this is an axial sonogram. You see the hyperechoic cortical line, and you can see the break in this. So this is one that, for us, is another opportunity to evaluate with a skill that we have, or that some of us have, um, myself not included. Uh, the treatment, the non-displaced fractures can be treated conservatively with lower arm splinting, but even in the, um, less significant fractures, there's a risk for non-union or partial union. If you remember the anatomy, you have a small piece of bone that's attached to a small bone. So if there's a break there, the vascularity may not allow for it to heal. 
uh, if it's to splice surgery. Um, there was some talk of OIF, which is, I'm pretty convinced, the orthopedic alphabet. And excision of the hook is actually the gold standard. Once again, this was an SAE question. I was kind of shocked to see that the way this is treated primarily is removing the hook. This is uh, Dr. Fang, who is slacking off today, who did a surgical internship. So just a little memory device. But the risk, if you're excising the hook, is residual symptoms, including painful or weak grasp, altered sensitivity and tenderness of the scar. So if you have those things on your hand, once again, it kind of interferes with the function. There's also a study of low intensity pulsed ultrasound that I'll talk about in a minute. But non-union is the risk and why excision becomes the gold standard. Um, that kind of just drifts off. You have mobility of the fracture site. You know, if this is, this is not a place that you're, going to be able to keep still without casting, and even then you're going to have some movement. Um, poor blood supply, as we discussed, and a delay in diagnosis. Like in that case, uh, with the ultrasound, the patient had fallen four months prior, had seen a hand surgeon, and the x-rays hadn't shown anything. So that would be a case where she'd be a risk for non-union. Uh, this study by, this is actually a case report by Sakuma. This was a 63-year-old male, risk playing from playing golf, diagnosed with handmade fracture, was made on CT, but he didn't want surgery. So there's been a lot of other studies about using low intensity pulsed ultrasound for bone healing. So the group attempted that 20 minutes daily. After six months on CT, the fracture line was barely visible. And after a year, the bone was fused and confirmed on CT. Now this is a time consuming method, but you're avoiding surgery, the cost of surgery, and the risks of that excision. That, that was six months, six months daily, yes. Yeah. Like I said, it's time consuming. I, this is not the treatment of choice excision still is, but for patients who want to avoid surgery, who are poor surgical candidates, who love using ultrasound at home, I'm really sorry Justin isn't here because I like this guy's face in the front responding to three Dr. Avernus. <laughs> so a 40 year old male who presents to the clinic with pain and mild edema on the dorsal radial wrist. He says he loves rowing, he can't wait to get back on the Schuylkill. For our visitors, Schuylkill River separates the city, center city from West Philadelphia and it's where all the crew teams are and the boat houses are. I've never rode a day in my life. But uh, one of our attendings, Dr. Wynick, used to be the head physician for USA Rowing. So this was one of his recommendations. It says, but it hurts whenever he handles the oars. So this is intersection syndrome, otherwise known as peritendinitis creptans, subcutaneous perimyositis, squeaker's wrist, bugaboo forearm. That was my favorite. <laughs> Orsman's wrist and APL syndrome is an overuse syndrome associated with regular radial deviation of the wrist. Yeah, just like <laughs> So intersection syndrome also seen in canoeing, horseback riding, and deep powder or heli skiing for those of you lucky enough don't stand up in boats. So epidemiology, this is rare. Prevalence of 0.37% of all patients with arm or hand pain, 70% male. So this is another look at anatomy where our knowing anatomy can help diagnose this. The symptoms occur at the site where the extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus cross over the ECRL and ECRB in the wrist. It's just proximal to Lister's tubercle on the radial forearm and this site, this intersection site, is what causes this. And there's a lot, there's, I'll come back to the room for it, but the etiology is disputed, but some of the ideas are that there's a friction phenomenon due to the crossing of the tendons near the musculocutaneous junction. So you see that this is where the muscle bellies are transitioning to the tendons as site of four tendons crossing that that might predispose, and that tightness of the tendon sheath of the ECR 
such as ECRL and ECRB, the proximal edema and tenderness. Um, looking at the rowing grip for non-rowers here, um, there's a lot of extension in order to curl the oar, and that radial extension causes that intersection site to have more pressure. Clinically, patients will present with pain and swelling four to eight centimeters proximal to Lister's tubercle on the distal radial forearm. It can be crepitous in the intersection region. Pain is worse with twisting motion with radial deviation and pulling motion. The differential diagnosis here, we're often going to think about decoir veins or a tennis and of the second or third compartments. So if a patient comes to you and it looks like this, the big question is versus decoir veins. And the difference in this picture depicts it is that the decoir vein symptoms are more radial versus the intersection is a little bit more dorsal. And you may still get the response on the Finkelstein maneuver with the intersection syndrome. So a clinical history, and we'll talk about some imaging ultrasound. Uh, may show thickening of the tendon sheath and or effusion in the compartment, and we'll look at some of those images. Non-contrast MRI, if uncertain, that may show a tendon thickening. May show some edema. Uh, possibly secondary changes within the adjacent radial styloid and effusion. So this is some um, depiction of the anatomy and ultrasound versus MRI. This is a 45-year-old male with left distal forearm pain. In the upper left, you're seeing sort of a schema. I know it's small and hard to read, but this is the ECRB, ECRL, and the carpal bones. And in this case, this is the depiction of the effusion. And on ultrasound, you can see that effusion, and MRI is confirming the same. Another one, this is a 56-year-old male, and the top is another schema. Um, this one includes the EPL, and you've got the ultrasound on the bottom. The effusion may be due to tendinous synovitis of the tendons of second and or third extensor compartments. So you may see effusion in one of the compartments in both, and that effusion can communicate as well. Um, here's the ultrasound depiction. Uh, conservative treatment is the start, reduction in rowing element of training, changing the size of the oar or skull handle. I don't know the size option. Technique changes, rowing with the oar square all the time. Uh, one author said, teaching the rower to rotate the oar by rolling the fingers rather than the wrist. Rest, ice, insets, splinting. You can do a thumb spike a cast or, excuse me, spike a splint or a static wrist splint. Um, injection and surgical treatment when conservative treatment fails. So the injection of a steroid into the second dorsal compartment. So this is one if you've got ultrasound available, it's one where you want to be sure you're going into the compartment and not directly into the tendon. Um, operative options include release of the second extensor compartment and synovectomy of the wrist extensor tendons. So that's another case or we can use the ultrasound, and I know we do dorsal wrist injections, but this is a little bit more specific, a little bit more guided one. Okay, questions, unless you're, okay, uh, Peter, they'll vet your questions. But any questions? A little shorter. Is that with the in back? Yeah. Um, the idea of it's incidental. We decided, I guess, dramatically, what we do about it. I think you have follow-up radiographs. I didn't see as much about incidental finding. Usually, normally it presents with symptoms. I think incidentally you need to follow up with radiographs. Um, and depending on what grade it was found incidentally, two, you could probably follow. But if it was later stages, it probably weren't an orthopedic consult. Is that it's, this is like a cornerstone. This is a keystone for the hand. And if you're collapsing the rest of the hand. So I'd say grade one or two to follow, but if it's further down the line, even if it's incidental, it's probably worth talking to somebody who can manage it less conservatively. I didn't talk about it, but are ganglion cysts a lot less common than these guys? Uh, ganglion cysts are more common than these guys. Okay, so too common for 
just less associated with a specific sport. Part of this was the fact that, I talked about this in my paper, is that we get a lot of exposure to basketball, football, soccer, of other injuries, but our patients aren't necessarily going out and playing these. A lot of the 50-year-old guys may not be playing pickup basketball and pickup soccer on the weekends. They're going to be playing you know, doctor's golf or cycle. That's, I think, like the number one and two. Some crazy of us go climbing, um, and I never understand why people want to wake up at 4.30 to get in a boat on a cold river, but around here they do. So these are other sports that may not be D1 and may not be pro players, but these are the everyday patients who are playing sports on the weekends and in the wrist and hand for anybody who uses their hands at work, including a lot of physicians, uh, if this isn't addressed, can cause further problems down the line. A little shorter than I intended, but that's all I have.